Hi guys, welcome to another workshop video. This is just going to be about a few things. Uh, first off, it, there has been a huge announcement in the AI community that this week, to people in the US apparently, that includes me, uh, will be getting access to the advanced voice mode for ChatGPT. So this is something that OpenAI just announced uh, from Sam Altman himself. Now, my channel is not a AI news channel. I'm not here to, to like talk about it and you know what's coming up in rumors and what's expected. But I do occasionally use. It's been a little bit, but I do use AI sometimes as a tool for oracles, for the, as a player, as a DM. It's been quite a bit uh, <clears throat> since I, I've been using AI in general on this channel, as I typically uh, have been falling back on just the conventional means, using just uh, tables and dice oracles and uh, stuff like that. But the recent announcement that ChatGPT will be releasing the advanced voice mode is very intriguing because that can be used as a uh, mechanism for the oracle. Now, the only there's a couple of questions up in the air right now until they actually release it to either the phone or and or I should say to the Mac OS app that I have also. Which I've, uh, well, I don't know if I've done a demonstration before. I think I have done a demonstration before on this channel. I don't recall. Anyways, it's very intriguing because to have ChatGPT as a as either a player or the DM would be amazing. And we've done it before via text. But the voice feature, what I want to know is, will it be tied to custom, not custom instructions, but ch ch uh, GPTs as the feature? When you open your GPT up, your custom GPT, will the voice feature kick in when you click the headphone icon or the speaking icon within that GPT conversation? If not, there's also the custom instructions that you have on your account that's open to all conversations aside from GPTs themselves. And the memory feature, if the voice feature will coincide, will work along with the memory uh, feature itself. So there's a couple of questions. Once I get access, I'm going to, you know, try it, see how it works. And also, the, it will obviously have limits. So I don't think I can do a full video uh, using the voice feature for like a one shot or uh, at least uh, I, we don't know. the. I really don't know the limits of how long. It will last before it says, oops, sorry, you you have to use a standard voice feature because or either of the servers are being overused and stuff like that. So and how similar will it be to the demo that we saw back in May? But yes, anyways, I don't care much for about the singing thing it can do or the different what what's intriguing is the different voices it can do. If it can get really into character, the NPCs you interact with, it can it can portray a dwarf or it can portray an elf like you're talking to some men you know fantasy character that's another intriguing aspect so this bot there's obviously a lot of possibilities but i don't want to get my hopes too uh i don't want to get my hopes too high i've seen us uh, i've been following some twitter users who have had access to the advanced voice mode feature since they were allowed it as a as um testers beta testers during the very, very slow move out. Again, I'm not going to talk about that or criticize it. Just saying it's been a very, very slow move out to the alpha users, I should say. And there have been some very intriguing results. Now, uh, I think GPT can be a very powerful tool as an either an Oracle player or a DM. The player is the most intriguing aspect. Oracle, you can get anywhere. You can get Oracles online. You can get the, you can get the cards. You can get uh, use GM um, and uh, Netflix GM emulator, or you can just uh, you know think of the re uh, think of the content yourself off the top of your head, as I've done many times before. But using uh, an Oracle, using the AI as an Oracle, but with the active voice in the background, that's actually really intriguing too. I'm kind of torn between the the, the player and the voice mode. The DM, yeah, you know, also uh, quite intriguing, but I kind of want to maintain the whole solo aspect for this channel. But I won't shy away from using GPT as a DM, also <clears throat> depending on the rate limit, the usage limit of, of what you can use, uh, how long you can use it for. 
And there's also the restrictions that might apply because again, solar RPGs can get brutal in the details and can get violent. So you're stabbing a, you know, a, a, you're stabbing, cut the head off of a, of a goblin. You're in a fight. It gets, again, the details can get brutal and depends on, and also it's at the, you're at the mercy of the DM, uh, the AI as a DM. It, it will hold itself back from those kind of details. It is filtered. It will not, it will not go that deep unless you're using an open source AI, which there is ones, there's hundreds out there that are not filtered and they're not uh, restricted like that. So they will detail things very brutal. Like in AI Dungeon, for example, there are models on there that you can turn off the filter and it really turns right at R. So again, uh, GPT is at the, you know, you're at the mercy of a proprietary uh, AI by, held by a, a, a billion dollar company, however big they are. And you have to play by their rules, but it doesn't it doesn't take away from the effect. I, I wouldn't have think you're still talking to an AI in real time. Once this advanced voice feature gets released officially within this week, supposedly, unfortunately, not to the EU uh, people in the EU or etc., which is unfortunate. Again, I know there's a lot of restrictions in in, the, in that uh, in Europe itself because of the uh, the safety concerns and regulations. But again, I don't live in the EU, so I can't really tell you from my experience. I just know there's a few. Twitter users that I follow who talk about that and they're, they are in the EU and they talk and they mention the, the shortcomings and the, the unfortunate setbacks they have to deal with uh, once, uh, you know, OpenAI um, works something out with the EU, if, if that's what it takes. But uh, back to basically using AI for DM and I guess for this channel, it would be more relevant if it was if I were to use it as an Oracle which we've done hundreds of times before using a text-based. Now, next topic I want to talk about uh, is my um, next uh, campaign, which also kind of sits with my third topic, and that is starting small. Now, one thing uh, that I have done before in this channel too often is try to start too big. I try to start with a this huge world, so just picture this map right here is the world I want to explore. I have the whole world created. I, you know, I have locations set out. I have um, different terrain, climate, uh, locations, routes to take. I start way too big, and I'm, my, you know, my single lonely player, or at least the four of them, start somewhere in that map, and I want to explore everything. The problem is this gets too heavy for my for my feeble little mind. And I have all this dice to use, and, and I get caught up in all the details, and, and it takes away from the experience. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, and I've done it before. I start small, mainly my one shots. They don't continue. They don't go past you know, a single episode. And I've done the one shot recently, which was refreshing to step away from Lone Wolf. Which the Lone Wolf, I think I'm done with it. It lasted ten episodes, unofficially ended after a um, a one off. Um, like post main quest. I think I'm done with the lone wolf for now. Uh, the other reason is because uh, another example is the sector void, which a few select people that follow me know about. It was a sci-fi campaign. I wanted to try with, I don't recall the rules what I was going to use at the time, but I know I did it in the AI dungeon for a bit. And that was fun, except AI dungeon was getting too much context. It was getting clouded. So I had to stop. It was losing its context light window, but uh, Sector Void is a prime example of, of uh, me trying to start way too big in a very interesting concept where the whole galaxy, the whole, this, this uncharted, not uncharted, this galaxy that's, that's war-torn, uh, post, not apocalyptic, but... Uh, all right, guys, I'm back. Sorry, I had a knock at the door. I took care of that. But like I was saying, uh, Sector Void, I was, uh, it was a... Uh, the region itself, the, the the region of space, as I say, was um, handled, run by criminal syndicates, organizations. It was a it was a mess, but they had a system. So then there was Yugo, which was this um, outlining force that was trying to take over the region, and my character was kind of caught in the middle of it. So I had the whole like universe, the whole region set out. I had all the planets that designed and in, in the background. And I had um, events lined up for the character, and it became such a toll. I never actually officially released Sector Void. It became such a headache. I, I went to, to, I think I went to Misfortune instead. Um, so, and Misfortune 
was very procedural. It was a very conventional start. I, I started small on a map and I started to grow. I, I did different methods of the play. I did notes. I did the uh, journaling. I did uh, face FaceTime style. I, it was it was a mess production wise, but it was not really a problem for me on the actual adventure. So that was kind of a handoff on, on one problem with another. But I'd rather have a disorganized approach to it technically while still liking being interested in the in the the world itself, which it was. But then it, it got out of control. It got too big for me. And so I, I trashed it. Now, um, I think starting small would be uh, beneficial because you are focused on one isolated moment and your character, whoever they are, if it's one or more. Um, you can you can focus on the one moment and you can step by step grow the story the, the setting and then uh, go on to the next thing depending on how much you want to focus on the role play which i you know i try to have a, a balance here between not role playing too much but also not taking away from the mechanics of it or not trying to focus too much on you know rolling every single thing uh, dice for every single thing uh, that's why i like to use rolls light systems here because I, I don't want to focus uh, too much on swifting through books while forgetting what's happening in the in the setting or in the campaign. So there's that balance between role playing just enough while also enjoying the rules and rolling the dice to advance your character. So I let me introduce introduce you guys to my next two characters. I have no idea where they're going to start. I have no idea what's going to happen or what the setting will be. It will be fantasy, but it will be a system familiar to a few of you guys, and that's World of Dungeons. I've gone back between a few systems trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. I did World of Dungeon, Dungeon World for my last one shot, which was Zoom on the, the, the zombie bunch. But I was falling into World of Dungeons. I was leaving not the complexity of, of Dungeon World, but the moves. And I just, I just kind of simplified it. I went with World of Dungeons, which is very simple. The rules do fit. On literally one page and then you have a, a leveling up system which is also great the only real concern here is that how long will my this new series go this new campaign i always like to try these new campaigns and remember you're limited to 2d6s rolling against the the, the difficulty ranges the power by the apocalypse style system and if you if you get up to plus four then you can only roll a fail out of the 12. Well, I should say out of the 11. So 2d6, the lowest possible is 2, and then your highest possible is 12. And if you have 4 for that one ability, then you have a great chance of succeeding, but then where's the challenge in that? So I was thinking about just expanding it to either a d20 system beyond that and kind of resetting the rules or expanding it to a higher range of difficulty where there is that fail, partial success, and the and the uh, common success, but with a D20. So you or you or it's going to be a uh, I have a, there's a reason why I have my I have the dice here in this video because I wanted to demonstrate this. We expand the, the 2D6 to a 2D10, and the range grows up to 20, but there's still that bell curve between the two dice. So instead of 2D6, we kind of just stretch it to 20 with the 2d10s i think that makes sense so it's like trying to figure out where the partial success window would be so 10 through 15 or i don't know failure would be below 10 perhaps because like 2d6 the failure is below six i'm thinking okay the six is there for a reason so the failure would be below 10 partial would be 11 through maybe 15 16 and a great success the bore at would be uh, 16 or 17 up to, to 20. So that's what I'm thinking about the 2D, 2D 10s. And you, the advantage with World, with World of Dungeons, it's so easy to mod. I don't have to make a ha hack for it. I, I just know what to do off the top of my head where I'm like, okay, I have these very basic modifiers. It says 2D 6 in the rules, but again, the rules is a page long. Or it's literally half a page. The other half is, is inventory and classes. This, these, these stats could easily work for a 2d10 method of, of powered by the apocalypse i think it could and i've tried it off camera before and it actually does work so 
I just have to, I would have to make a little card that details my ranges with the updated 2D20 system, or sorry, 2D10 system. That's always a possibility. And, it, and you know, that depends on how long the campaign goes. Like if we hit, because again, the, uh, let me show you guys the uh, leveling up system here. It's been, it was crafted very uh, specifically by J.S. Harper. I think that's his name. It's right down here, the creator of uh, Dungeon World. He also made Lasers and Feelings, which is another fantastic one page, but it's very, very simple. So it's good for like a really quick one shot with some friends. It's not as, you know, not this focused on leveling up and it has, you know, you have hip dice, you have abilities and you have skills and all that. Lasers and Feelings, you have a couple of traits and there's like one number you have to roll to add or under or above or under, depending on your character. But if you notice here, the skills, or the attributes goes up to three. Which for me, I was going to push it to four for 2d6, but that still leaves you in line for a failure if you just up to three. So with the 2d idea, we could start at it in the beginning and mod it to the, from, from the 2d6, or I can start 2d6, and once I max out my characters to the, um, the plus three requirements, or plus four, you know, got a little buffer, then we push, like, okay, we we're gonna push this campaign into a new trail, it's going to be 2d10. So that's a possibility with, with that approach. But these are my two characters here. I might as well int introduce you guys to them. This is Gilbert, and this one's Maine. This guy's a fighter. Uh, this guy right here is a ranger. And there's their stats. Again, they're, they're not too impressive. Ranger has plus two on dexterity, which is important. And then fight, uh, the warrior, sorry, uh, the fighter, is he, uh, he has a uh, plus one strength. I probably could have swapped that for Wisdom or Con, which you can do. So you can swap it up to, I think you can swap up to two, or you roll in, in order. Or you bend the rules as you want. But this is what their stats are. I did give them a little extra push for uh, because I'm, I'm doing the solo with two characters. I gave them um, my first initial hit die I rolled. I, I doubled it. And then the rest is just based on modifiers and the perks of having these skills. So but that's really it, guys. I just want to show you. This quick little uh, preview here. I might shuffle these statistics after the video, but uh, these will be the two characters moving forward for my next video or my next campaign, whatever it will be. And the other thing was uh, talk, what I, I wanted to finish closing with is um, the approach to the play. Now, I know I've tried everything. I've tried it digitally uh, with a hex map. We've done um, Theater of the Mind. What I want to try is that I have a I've talked about this before. I have a portable screen. I can lay flat right here on the table and use it as a map just for the maps that are focused on one area alone, not a whole like region. We could try that, but then I would be falling into, I've been falling prey into my whole, i become a hypocrite and say, oh, look, I have, a, I have this whole world I want to explore. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to focus the map on a little section of area where my characters can explore and then go from there. So it would be a mix of digital and analog play. And I would take notes, but not as detailed as I always try not to do. So, But in any event, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. That was mainly, that's all I wanted to talk about. Not too very long, not very long. And uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.